I am Laura Greenleaf, um, and along with Emily Jean Fortoni, one of the original, I guess original is redundant, but founders <laughs> of the James River Park System Invasive Plant Task Force. And then with M, uh, one of the part-time um, staff now, the Invasive Plant Management Coordinating Staff for the Park System. And this is the last of our workshops. So we've been, as you probably might realize, doing these um, two Saturdays in a row, and this is the, our last opportunity. So thanks for being here, glad you have your books. And we are, of course, gonna be discussing invasive plants and their impact on the park system and everything else, and how we can shift um, a balance back toward native uh, flora and to support habitat. Just disclosure, that is not the James River Park System on the right. It's just a gorgeous pink strip bloom azalea, <laughs> it, which is native to this area. And that is in Forest Hill Park, which, you know, is there are no real boundaries uh, adjacent to the James River Park System and just provides a nice contrast with the photo on the left. So we are going to be giving you, I want to give you a little bit of background on how, like who we are and how we have come to address invasive plants in the park system. Uh, kind of a, a, a baseline understanding of what we mean um, when we talk about invasives, how, what that ecology is like, what's impacting the park system, how, how we approach management and how you can kind of adapt that model yourself, uh, the things that you might have at home um, and how to get started. So again, I mentioned that we are founders of the park of the Invasive Plant Task Force that did come together in 2015 when a few tree stewards and Virginia master naturalists like me and Emily got together. At that point, there was nothing, there was nothing formal and very little informal going on in the park system in terms of addressing invasive plants. There was a loose network of people who were sort of, we were the invasive plant people and it was a focus of ours. And there were occasional projects in the park, but we were recognizing that this was reaching a crisis, had reached a crisis stage as the main ecological threat to the health of the park system and that we needed to come together, to work together and to work strategically to address invasive plants in the park. And immediately we needed to partner with the park system itself, of course, uh, the park administration. So we very quickly met with then superintendent Nathan Burrell and became partners in that effort. And then eventually, or really about the same time, uh, also joined forces with Friends of James River Park who became the, uh, the fiscal agent for the task force. So the task force does exist independently of park administration, but it's not a nonprofit on its own. So Friends serves as the fiscal agent for the task force, but uh, the park administration and the task force um, you know, works extremely closely. And nine years later, nine years, yes, this is how it's evolved over time with uh, sort of momentum building, uh, support and financial support that we are now able to have staff. So we do, and um, this is the, the images are a little brighter than they normally are, but you can see we, we really like to coordinate our outfits. <laughs> Just so you're very clear that this is the staff of invasive management in the park system. But three of us part-time plus Megan, uh, who is AmeriCorps and dedicated to, um, uh, to the invasive plant management team, but we still have the task force leaders who do a lot of outreach and education uh, like this, as well as leadership of project areas in the park. And then the entire thing is underpinned by this, this workforce of amazing volunteers um, from all walks of life, but uh, corporate groups, service groups, just the general public. And again, this is all just you know, coordinated. Uh, just to further clarify though, because it can be confusing, we are staff and we work for the park system, but we're not city employees. So again, we rely on friends at this time, the way things are right now, that's um, public and private funding, grant funding that flows through the funds of the James River Park to support the staff. So it's this, might, might seem kind of, it's very creative, and it's, uh, but it's, it's a huge leap forward compared to where we were nearly 10 years ago. Oh but right, so this is our focus. Our focus is invasive plants. What is your, like, 
you th- I mean, somebody always exclaims, you're like, ah, or oh my God, like, what, do, what do you feel when you see this? It's sad. Yeah. No, not good. Does anybody know what that is? Kudzu. Yes. And we don't know what's underneath of it, right? It could be, could be a house, definitely trees. It looks like where you look down from Hollywood Cemetery. Yeah. In the summer. You know, yeah, it's just a wasteland, yeah. right? Yeah. So we do have this. You don't have to be, you don't have you you don't have to know much at all about invasive plants to sort of have that instinctive gut level reaction of not good. This isn't good. And mm-hmm. you know, we t- I use the the the, the language. What we want to use is invasive plant or invasive species. Sometimes they're they're still called you know alien or exotic species, um, which is they're not incorrect terms. It's just not the legal term. Um, but we also somewhat often instinctively think like this can't be. Not only does I do I not feel good about this, but I don't think this is going to be good for the environment. But to get a little more technical about it, we can't really understand what an invasive species is without the context of what native or indigenous species are, right? They, it is two sides of the same coin. So there is a legal definition, a federal definition of invasive plants and our state definition is built off of that, but this is kind of a working definition. So our native species are those that we know have naturally occurred in a particular region. Um, they meaning, and that importantly, that they co-evolved in that region over millions of years. So we can, you know, we we know this. That's their sort of ecological history, and they're the foundation of the healthy ecosystems. Why is that? Why are plants down there at that foundation? What do we need them for? <laughs> Everything lives off of them, right? Like they're they're the things that produce their own energy. They photosynthesize. They grow. They are the food source for everything else. All all living beings, uh, starting most of all with insects. So we know that there are those really complex. Most insects, first of all, insects are most of the the biomass in the world, and even though they are precipitously dwindling. Um, and most of this, those species are specialists. They need certain plants to live, and that's because of this, by this evolutionary biology. So we've got to have to have a healthy ecosystems. We have to have native plants, but then, and you know, every invasive plant is native somewhere. But by definition, an invasive plant is an introduced species. It has been introduced to a region in which it did not evolve. And those introductions might be deliberate, on purpose, or just an accident. They are prone to runaway expansion, like that kudzu, and they cause harm. So this element of ca- the, the documentable, provable harm is essential to officially recognizing something as invasive in a particular place. And when it comes to those impacts, I'm like actually like, I brought the report, if anybody wants to use it. They're like, yeah, I really want to read that report. Um, this report came out uh, last year and was provided to the United Nations um, that, that uh, pinned down this number of nearly $423 billion in costs in the year 2019 for invasive species. And important to know, it's not just plants. So when, I, when we talk about invasive species and their impact, we're talking about plants, animals, and diseases or pathogens. I mean, we're totally focused on plants, but the big picture, it's all living systems. And of that enormous figure, most of that those, that cost is just their impact, their harm, the harm that they do. It's not even getting into the management of them. So this, we are a microcosm of this problem, but this is a global problem. And from the ecological standpoint, ecological harm, the same report recognized invasive species as number two, second only to outright habitat loss in terms of driving down uh, biological diversity worldwide. We don't need to dwell too much on that, but that's kind of like, why, why bother? This is why bother. And we are responsible. So we do have to take responsibility and are not for the not for the whole world, not even for the whole park system, but for some little part of it uh, individually and then collectively take responsibility because we are the source of the problem. We have been moving around the world and moving stuff with us 
since we got up on two legs pretty much. And we've just continued to do that more efficiently, more speedily and at a greater scale. Mm. And of course, unfortunately, this is an image that's become really familiar this past week, right? That this is the what we're we're moving constantly um, across oceans. But you know, this the next in, right now the next invasive plant could be arriving at a port near you. Um, oh my. So I don't mean for the, you're not supposed to be able to read this by the way. <laughs> you know, you know, it, it, it's fine not be able to get text. It's just. This is the official Virginia Department of Conservation Recreation list of what is identified as in, an invasive plant in Virginia. It has no regulatory teeth. It's not a regulatory list, it's a scientific list. So it has been determined that these plants have some level of invasiveness in a region of Virginia. There are 90 species and I, this is not the updated list, but so about 90 species plus what we call early detection species. So like the watch list of what might be earning its way um, onto this list. So yeah, in Virginia, 90 species. And I can tell you that in the park system, we've got about two thirds of these. And most of them were horticultural introductions, meaning intentional. Somebody thought it was a really great idea to add this to our cultivated environments and and commercialize them. Well, let's get back to what interests us the most, which is the ecological impacts of these plants and how do they what what impact do they have um, on our environment? And they literally change things from the ground up. So, so now I am. I'm not, a, I'm not a soil scientist, I'm not a scientist, period, but if you, there's a lot of inter interesting research out there in the changes to soil content and chemistry. It gets a little bit more relatable when you get into this nutrient cycling, including how water moves through a system and how they can make changes to that. Very obvious with community structure. So when I say community structure, it's like we can picture downtown, right? And you might have smaller human scale buildings and you know much taller buildings in a huge city you might have skyscrapers that's exactly how the natural environment is where you have herbaceous plants at a ground level and you've got vines and shrubs in the mid-story or understory understory trees big trees invasives change that structure uh and it's kind of evident in that top picture where you've got this dense invasive vine ground cover that's suppressing the regeneration, the succession of the forest there. So you get this flattening effect and you've got nothing coming up behind it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but you get changes in density. It just doesn't look the way it should look. And then community composition, this gets to the point of the biological diversity because when you're changing the membership of that community and you're wiping out certain members of that community, uh, or reducing their numbers. That's when you're changing the makeup of the natural plant community of the native plants. So you're getting less diversity of native plants and less abundance of each of those native species. And just here are some visual examples of what that's like. These images aren't coming through real sharply, but um, that is this <laughs> sweet little plant. <laughs> sweet little plant does this. Ficaria verna spreads into these vast mats, carpets, um, completely eliminating spring wildflowers. So out goes that part of the community. To a very different plant, but kind of similar effect, Japanese stilt grass, annual grass that uh, emerges in mid to late spring and matures in late summer. Ivy overtopping trees, right? Changing community structure. And this one's probably one you're not too familiar with, which I wish we were all not <laughs> familiar with this. This is Japanese knotweed, which you're, you were talking about the United Kingdom uh, has been such a destructive problem there for so long that they've been passing laws and regulations having to do with knotweed for 40 years. Uh, but you can see, so this gets to the, the hydrology and the processes where it loves, it likes to grow along waterways. That's its preferred spot. Uh, you've got, and in all these cases, you've got these monocultures. You have this one plant dominating. 
Same thing here, you see the erosion of that stream bank and you see the root systems hanging down. So that is, you know that that is affecting the water quality of that waterway and uh, the water level most likely as well, temperature, other things. How do they do this? How do they go, how do they achieve, how do they, you know, reach this level of invasiveness? There are certain characteristics um, of invasive species. This kind of goes, you know, this is true of animals too, if you're looking at an invasive animal, but they have certain characteristics that come together and then just make them likely to be a, a you know, a, a super achiever in invasiveness. And the first one is that they don't have any natural enemies. They don't have predators. That goes back to the fact that they didn't co-evolve here and they don't have the relationships with the other living things feeding on them. They're really prolific reproducers. So uh, they tend to mature early. They tend to reproduce in more than one. They have more than one mode of reproduction and then it's high volume. Like they're producing a ton of seeds, for instance, and other little adaptations. And they're, they're extremely not picky about where they grow. Typically, you know, like that's Japanese stilt grass, it really does like damper environments and it does like uh, riparian areas, uh, land that's adjacent to streams, for instance, but you'll see it growing kind of everywhere, <laughs> sun, shade, roadsides, you know, you name it. So they're not niche species, even in their home range. And then in addition to those, that sort of basic set, they often have characteristics that just give them this competitive edge over native plants. So for instance, that is um, your honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle. It's everywhere right now um, in the park and outside of the park. It's an invasive shrub and it leafs out extremely early and it has this really long photosynthetic period. So it still has its leaves into December typically. That's a really big advantage. It's also shading out what's underneath of it. Plus it's from these unbelievably dense thickets that nothing else, you, got, you have nothing but on your honeysuckle. And to top it all off, it's also allelopathic, which many invasive plants are. That means it produces its own chemical compounds that suppress the growth of other plants. So you wrap all these things together and then you, they meet a susceptible site because you've got to have the place, right? And invasives love disturbed areas, which means pretty much anything, any like construction, edge habitat, trails, roads, new home sites, roads, etc. That's where they tend to take, take hold and take off. And then they have this kind of arc, this life cycle um, of their, their progress, right? So, you know, there is the, when they, when they arrive, there's the, ideally we're preventing, you know, prevention is, would be the goal uh, of the next wave of invasive species. However, once they, if, that, if you miss that opportunity, hopefully you catch it really, really early and you just have really small limited populations very localized, haven't really spread, and you knock them out. Unfortunately, we tend to miss that phase, and we have certainly missed that phase with most of what's in the park system. And being human, we tend to not notice the problem until the problem knocks us over. And we start finally figuring it out, and so maybe we have a chance to contain, which is kind of what we're trying to do with Fig Buttercup, like Harry Verna in the park, because it is extremely widespread on private property. It's going to keep flowing into the park, but we're really trying to contain it from getting any further in the park. But you keep going and you're like, you know, this is where people think, why, why, why don't you just give up? Well, we don't give up because there's still things to protect. So you're still trying to just pull the reins back, um, manage it on some level and protect the resources that are still surviving. Springtime in Richmond, springtime in Virginia. What are the signs of spring? Mm -hmm. So this is just a specimen. These are just sort of ornamentals in a neighborhood. It's actually right by Pony Pasture on private property, but I have been doing a lot of driving this month and it's a terrible time of year to be going up and down interstates in Virginia because it's just everywhere. 
So if you just think when you're at um, interchanges right now, a um, lot of VDOT right of way, undeveloped land, it's all Bradford pear. This is not what Virginia is supposed to look like in spring. That's the on your honeysuckle I mentioned, by the way. You'll never, you'll never look at that pale green <laughs> uh, the same way again. And um, little purple flowers, pretty little purple flowers. Anybody know what that is? Periwinkle. Yes, periwinkle. It's such a pretty word too, isn't it? Vinca. Yeah. Um, it's it's putting out its flowers. That too is invasive. And then again, my favorite plant to pick on. Uh, this one, you know, people like. I think didn't somebody say? I think um, you were telling me that someone was like showing you, like, look at this beautiful oh, yes. flower. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, that's what I'm out here treating right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He had his camera with him, yeah. and yeah. he was like, I hate to tell you this, but. Yeah. <laughs> So those are a few things, um, but this is like the sort of short, my short list. Not, this is not an official list. This is just my observation of things that might be familiar to you that you might have in your yard or your neighbor's yard uh, that maybe you're never gonna think of in the same way again because now you know that they're invasive. But this is, these are some of the primary culprits that are in our neighborhoods. And because they're in our neighborhoods, they're in the park. And this is like, this is not showing up well at all, but you know, this, it's a map of the park system with, you can really see the boundaries of the neighborhoods. This is very densely developed. I mean, even in the least densely developed neighborhoods, it's still dense. So. Everything that's in, you know, and there's no real boundary. Um, what's in the yards, what's on the private property, that's where the invasive species came from. Okay, they, they came from the private park property. They escaped cultivation because they're invasive. They come into the park system and that cycle just goes on and on. So even if we're able to make great headway in the park, it's still coming, it's perpetually, right? That reproductive and the dispersal continues to come. So um, this, this particular map was generated in 2015 because at the start of the task force, we had the good fortune of just certain things happening at the same time where VHB Inc. wanted to do a, a baseline study of invasives in the park system, uh, which was funded by friends and the task force came along and was the volunteer force behind that. So this was this this is that original study looked at we surveyed every park unit that you see there. Um, and that's the point at which we started to have an idea of what we were we were quantifying what we had to deal with. And this is just one example. So I'm not going to show you all those maps from now nearly 10 years ago, but this is one example of this segment of Buttermilk Trail from the boulevard to Reedy Creek with this little key here. So we were looking at each species on a list and the list came from DCR and we were estimating how abundant that invasive species was in each little unit. And then each of those species was further organized by a, whether it was a grass, uh, a herbaceous plant or a grass, a shrub, a vine, a tree. And so, and then all of that data got aggregated to come up with a cover class for those units. Like how bad is it? And needless to say, red is bad. And so red is 75% invasive cover or above. And most of the park system was red or orange. You know, <laughs> that might feel overwhelming. It does feel overwhelming, but it kind of just confirmed what we knew. It was giving us a play, an idea of what we needed to focus on. And that red circle is a project focus area that we'll talk a little bit more about, but not trying to, not trying to address this entire thing, but picking out a particular place for particular reasons and focusing invasive management long-term on that spot. So this is, again, just one example of that. Um, and having to pick out that one place is the only way you're gonna take a step forward if this is what you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. This is not Buttermilk Trail, this is Huguenot Flatwater. And what you're seeing is winter creeper and on um, your honeysuckle. And other than the trees that are underneath the winter creeper, 
not much else. So this can be discouraging as an understatement, right? Like how, what do you do? Because a lot of people end up, and it doesn't matter if it's, if they're a volunteer in the park or if it's somebody with their own property, they end up in a place of absolute helpless, hopeless despair. And it was really that feeling, honestly, that motivated the start of the task force. You know, that like, I can't do it on my own. We have to come together. We have, have to do something. At the other end of the spectrum is the impulsivity, where you occasionally get people, sometimes it's a rogue volunteer, it's well, in, it's, I guess you could say it's well-intentioned. I'm not so sure I really consider it well-intentioned, but some, some people's personality, they want to just barrel in and they just like, they just ride off and sometimes swinging a machete um, and you can end up doing a lot of damage. So somewhere you got to be in between and, and, and use your energy to do good. And the where the place that you always have to start is in a place of contemplation, a, a thoughtful, well-informed um, start to your management plans, which is why we stand around a lot and we think. <laughs> and we think some more. And we bring other people in with us and we bring, you know, the not, not better and brighter minds, but people with a certain areas of expertise. Um, that's Anne Wright in the foreground, who's a uh, wildlife biologist, retired professor of VCU, member of the task force, project leader at Buttermilk Trail. Kevin Heffernan is the stewardship biologist from DCR who is in charge of that invasives list. He's been with DCR for about 30 years now. And so we were contemplating not weed because this was when we were just getting started on a pilot project to address not we had a very special part of Bell Isle that we ultimately used contractors to help us get started on to make sure we were doing things right but at some point you don't keep you know you don't just stand around thinking forever you have to get to work and this too is buttermilk trail and it's kind of early days but i don't you know and again the it's a little bit brighter than it usually is, but um, you can still see the line. They're removing uh, English ivy ground cover. So the left has cleared and the right is yet to come. And that approach, the, the guiding, our, our guiding compass of this approach is to focus and prioritize. So you remember that circle in buttermilk, which you can kind of see it bumped out there as well. These are our project focus areas, and it's not the whole park system. It's this very you know, broad brush circle around the park units that have a project focus area, but the project focus areas tend to be very small because you've got to set priorities and you have to have achievable goals that you're going to be able to sustain over time. And it is rewarding, despite very often feeling overwhelmed. Um, it is rewarding. This is Pony Pasture. This is when uh, Emily and I uh, first got started because this was our project focus area as Riverine Master Naturalists. This is what this is what a lot of the park still looks like, but this is by the rapids. And we started leading volunteer events to do manual removal. That's actually Emily and me in December. <laughs> <It's us. laughs> Uh, wondering what we were doing probably and just kept going and kept going, um, including in the pandemic. You might notice somebody with a mask on. Those are just mountains of winter creeper. And we'll talk a little bit about like the wisdom of manual removal later. But this is, this is, and this is not stopped. So this area is still a managed area. And if you've been down there in the past, you should go down there really soon because the bluebells are kind of past their peak now. Um, but this is what that area looks like now. And the, the bluebells, just to be, again, full disclosure, they had been planted in the past as part of a Native Plant Society project, pretty sure. But they are appropriate to that habitat. They were like the straight native species. They are really suited to that area and they really thrived along with a lot of native plants that rebounded on their own because the seeds were in the seed bed and they just needed access to resources that were you know, available to them when that winter creeper came out. So you take it out and it's not like it was never there because it has changed the soil so much. Mm -hmm. Here's another really gratifying example. This is Huguenot Flatwater, east of the Huguenot Bridge, 19 acres, pretty much every single tree on that 19 acres 
completely heavily encased in, in winter creeper vines. And we just got started and it's been two, I think it's been a little over, really two years. And I would I just use the number 1500 trees free because I feel pretty comfortable asserting that because we are counting them. And um, I started out leading the project there and M and Megan now lead volunteer projects there so you can free trees too. And this is Ann Caro's Landing. Um, uh, this is Ann Caro's Landing at the entrance and it's a little like a before and after picture, but it's like a done and not done picture. So on the left end of the slide, you're seeing where work has been accomplished. And on the right side, you're seeing where it has not. So the, what were they doing? Free a tree. And Gara Williams has led this work at, at Ann Caro's Free a Tree, removing the invasive privet and on your honeysuckle, primarily privet there in the understory and I think some brown cover removal as well, but that's really transformative and it certainly alters the experience of someone going into the park. And then to come back to buttermilk, there's the buttermilk effect, which has been to have a, quite a release of spring ephemerals um, in those areas that have been cleared. This is just a handful of trout lily, bloodroot, spring beauty of some of the things that have sprung forth once they had that opportunity. Let's see, where do we go from here? Here we talk, and then we're gonna talk about our management priorities. So I talked about these sort of like these two driving principles of focus and prioritize. I would add to that commit long-term. And that's just a given with invasive management. It's not something that you're like, oh, took care of that. <laughs> it's gonna be, it's a commitment. Um, but how do we set priorities? So pretty early on with the task force, this is what we came up with as these four um, focusing priorities. The first is tree canopy preservation. That kind of speaks for itself. I, the, the slide with the free a tree. Um, yeah, of course we've got, you know, we want our, our mature trees to survive and to have a healthy canopy that, that carries on. Uh, areas of conservation value. That's a kind of a broad category, but it's that natural resource protection where, oh, you, you, you've identified this um, population of native plants that is relatively uninvaded. You need to protect that, right? You have a wetland habitat that needs to be protected. So that's what we meant by conservation value. Public benefit acknowledges that it's a public park. <laughs> with something like a million and a half to two million visitors a year. And what we do influences the experience of the, of the people who visit the park. Emerging threats, this is an example of an emerging threat. So it's something that it is unfortunately much more widespread. Um, I can't say that we're in early, I don't think, you know, we're not eradication, probably not. Um, containment, yes. So species that are relatively new on the scene where it's and that are high risk, something like Ficaria verna, something like knotweed, they spread like wildfire. So it is not something, it's like that's, you don't take your eye off the ball with those species. So those are the four things that we decided we would prioritize. And even though we're dealing with a nearly 600 acre park system, spread over seven miles, you can use these same priorities with your own, I don't, if you have any amount, I don't, if you have a, 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 a tiny yard, if you have a quarter acre, if you have a half acre, the same things can help you decide what you want to do. Do I have trees that are have ivy or winter creeper growing up them? That's gonna be number one. Do I, if you have a natural area on your property, have you noticed uh, spring wildflowers that you would like to be able to survive? That's a conservation value. What do you like? Is there a view that you really enjoy? Um, is there a spot where you bird watch? Is there a place where you sit outside? That's your own sort of public benefit. And then once you become familiar with invasive plants, if you spot something that you know if you need to intervene, that would be your emerging threat. So this really, this is a, a pretty good template. And then kind of overhanging all of that is this notion of timing. And as you, if you dig into that field guide to invasive plants, and you get to know the plants, because the first of all, the first thing is you gotta know your plants. You wanna under, really, really understand the biology and life cycle of the plant itself, because that will tell you what to do and when 
to do it. You do something at the wrong time and it might be just ineffective or it might actually do harm. It might actually be contributing to the spread of that plant. So you've got to look at those factors to decide what your game plan is going to be. And then there are these categories of methods. And this is any anywhere you look um, about invasive plant management, you're gonna see these categories of methods. And we are gonna just fly, we're not gonna talk about biological and cultural methods, really, because first of all, we don't do biological control in the park. Um, not to say that it could never happen, um, but does anybody know what that means? Just kidding, like goats for grazing it? Or? Actually, goats, we'll talk about goats with the cultural methods, but biological methods are when you release a predator species from, from the native range of your target species to feed on that. Now, if that sounds like, ooh, that's a little, <laughs> like, you're really playing uh, <laughs> Mother Nature there, um, it's a highly regulated. So it's highly, highly regulated. It is a very slow process of testing and approval and release. And then it's not really, it it's, it's, tends to be more about just um, reducing overall um, abundance as opposed to really getting rid of something. So yeah, I don't want to get into that too much. Cultural, do I have a slide on cultural methods? No, I do not. Okay, I couldn't remember. So goats are an example of a cultural method, uh, although they sometimes fall into, they can call a mechanical method, so they could kind of pop up anywhere. But cultural methods kind of mean you're, you're altering your relationship to how you interact with the land. Um, sometimes that's campaigns <coughs> like um, Play Clean Go, where you see... Uh, uh, boot brush stations to encourage people to clean their boots so they're not moving seeds around. Um, campaigns to prevent aquatic hitchhikers that uh, that that's require people to clean their boats in certain ways and rinse things off so they're not moving zebra mussels or water hyacinth or something like that. So <laughs> prescribed fire is a cultural method for when and where that has the potential to be beneficial. And targeted grazing would be a cultural method. And we can, I don't want to start talking about goats right now, but we can talk about goats. <laughs> I wish I had a goat with me right now. <laughs> um, yeah, but what we want to do talk about is some of the things that, that we focus on and use and that in certain respects you can use too. So mechanical methods really run the gamut. Um, it can be a string, tr a weed eater, whacking stilt grass at the right time, or it could be dredging or forestry mulching or chainsawing down big privet thickets to treat the stumps. Um, but something that would certainly be within, or, you know, mechanical, I think, I guess uh, hand tools, I think often are also thrown into a mechanical method. So um, maybe that's the lower, the, the entry level, I mean, we're not, like we're not operating forestry mulching or anything, um, but that's that's an achievable thing. And so stilt grass is something we can talk about specifically if anybody has that as well. Um, chemical or hybrid methods. So we do use herbicides in the park. Um, it is extremely targeted. We'll talk about some of the principles of chemical methods. And a lot of what we do is this combined hybrid method where you're cutting something and you are very directly in a targeted manner applying the appropriate chemical um, to that species to translocate into the root system of that woody species mm -hmm. it's always the woody species to kill the root system and that is the reason we use chemicals in the park is that there are many invasive species that cannot be controlled any other way and not only can they not be controlled any other way they will spread if you attempt to do things manually or mechanically with them. Uh, it's also, you know, this is a matter of scale. You have one, um, we don't have Japanese barberry down here yet, but um, I just came from where I grew up, where I deal with a lot of Japanese barberry. Sure, one small Japanese barberry you can pull up, but if you have vast thickets of Japanese barberry, 
you're not going to do that. And if you go out to say, if you're ever out in the West, the Alleghenies, if you ever go out to Highland County, you will see these vast thickets of Japanese barberry because it was planted intentionally as forage, much like autumn olive. Um, so it's it's a tool in the toolkit, and you want to integrate methods. And a lot of times you're using multiple methods over time repeatedly um, to to you know, get that long-term effect. But so we can, how, how targeted is this chemical? Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's like chemical. Yes, um, yes, yeah. Sure. So that it's not harming any insect life or... So as an example, and I'm just gonna hold out because the, the mo most of what we do is this cut stem method up here. So that is, a, that is the stump of an obvious honeysuckle shrub. And as you can see, it is a multi-stem shrub. Mm -hmm. We have cut that down at the right time of year because timing matters and applied with that little plastic dauber mm -hmm. chemical that's 50% water because it's water soluble and 50% product. And the product itself is less than 50% active ingredient. So you see how this dilutes down. So you're only using what you need in terms of mm -hmm. concentration and you're applying it directly to that cut stem. So it's being drawn, translocated into the root system. So at that level, I mean, I don't think you could ever say zero collateral damage, but that is pretty darn close. Right. Now, um, and then this hack and squirt method for Alanthus trees is a form of, of treatment of invasive trees that will that are prone to root suckering. To hold, this, we'll get into that a little bit more later. That too, very direct. So there's just not really a vector for that to harm a pollinator, for instance. Foliar spraying, on the other hand, mm -hmm. really okay, like absolutely. And um, Blue Ridge Prism has a really good presentation, I think Emma and I both saw a couple of years ago, on reducing risk to pollinators when you do need to use foliar spraying. You know, for one thing, one thing to bear in mind is that um, with invasive plants, specialist insects aren't feeding on them, mm -hmm. but you do have generalists. So you might, you know, you would have like say bumblebees on um, Japanese knotweed blossoms. Well, first of all, you're not gonna be treating Japanese knotweed when it's in bloom. <laughs> so they're not gonna be, there will be no flowers because you wouldn't do that. But in terms of insect activity, earlier in the day is much better. So you wouldn't, you know, you would not be doing something at sort of peak pollinator activity. So you wanna target it earlier in the day and there's temperatures and things like that. And then you're simply, you know, you're really visually looking to avoid um, anything, including native plants. You know, we work around native plants if there's something, but you don't, nothing co-occurs with say Japanese knotweed, it's nothing but mm -hmm. knotweed. So it isn't a zero risk. I would never say anything's a zero risk. You reduce the risk. And then the toxicity, it also depends on the toxicity of the product itself. Um, and the things that we are using have a very, very low toxicity. Um, you know, particularly, I mean, people tend to worry a lot about, um, I mean, somebody was really concerned about deer and foxes and dogs. And, uh, and we, in a, when we were treating Ficaria verna, and you would have, they would have to ingest so much wet herbicide that this is the, it, it, it's, not, it's, it's, I can't imagine the scenario in which that would happen. Um, so I don't know how well that answers your question, but um, and I think you just have to also bear in mind that you were weighing, weighing benefits of your benefit because it's like, well, how good for native pollinators is it to have nothing but invasive species? Mm -hmm. Not very good, <laughs> right? They don't have their host plants. You don't have a healthy ecosystem. Another thing that's interesting, and this is completely separate from the James River Park system and completely separate from my job, but I worked um, as a volunteer and as a nearby, not landowner, sort of, uh, but near where I grew up, I grew up near the Appalachian Trail and there was not weed, and I was like, I could see it, growing above the Appalachian Trail corridor, very disturbing. And it wasn't even, this was on a roadside and spreading and spreading and ended up joining forces with the vegetation ecologist, the vegetation manager for the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club to address that, and it, it, we finally did it. We, he had to, he worked with the National Park Service. It 
required a special permit to treat the knotweed because many years earlier, there was a suspected observation of an endangered native bee species, the rusty patch. If anybody's familiar with the rusty patch bumblebee, it wasn't even confirmed. It was a suspected identification. And therefore that area was considered possible habitat, right? So that involved the Fish and Wildlife Service. And we actually didn't have to get a permit to treat. So it was, you know, this is evaluated like the National Park Service head scientists and all these people are involved just so we could treat. Mm -hmm. And then VDOT helped us as well because part of it was in the right of way. And so we were able to finally get this knotweed and stop this knotweed from spreading. So I, I, I feel like, you know, on balance, controlling the native species and hopefully, you know, restoring native habitat is a whole lot better for pollinators, but there are best practices mm -hmm. that you observe to, um, to minimize that. And this is what I was kind of getting into that you're always using the, the correct method for this, yeah. for the plant species at the right time, uh, with the, you know, the right product that's going to be effective, the very lowest concentration, you follow the label. So we are all, um, certified applicators. And we're working on public land. You don't have to be a certified applicator to use a, chem a general use herbicide on your own property, but we are, you know, licensed. Um, and again, precautions and best practices. So, I mean, I'm, you know, if anybody has any questions about anything we're doing, I'm happy to answer that. But we are, we do take this very seriously in how we apply this. And this Ficaria verna is. Um, a great, oh, here it is, yeah. You know, a great example of why we sometimes have to use chemicals. And this plant, unless you have just a couple of them in your yard that you can dig up and go deep and get the whole thing out, these fragments, so these little bulbs and these little tubers and the little thread-like roots, you leave anything behind or you break that up, it becomes a new plant. And that's how it spreads. And then it's dispersed along waterways, waterways through flood action or just regular flow and carries it downstream. And this is what you get. You can't dig that out. <laughs> um, and if you try to dig any amount out, you're going to multiply it and spread it. Manual removal, certainly the most accessible form of invasive control. And we do a lot of it. And some of it's also combined with a chemical treatment when it comes to that cut stump treatment. But again, you know, this, you saw the manual removal of winter creeper on the ground. This is on your honeysuckle. Granted, those stumps are going to get treated, but you can do, if you're, if you don't want to use chemicals or you want to maybe do it at another time, I did used to do this actually quite a bit before I became a certified applicator. We would high, what I called high stumping, made it up or I heard somebody else say it, it sounded good. And you would cut the shrubs kind of high so you could see them and you knew that you would cut it at a higher height, but you were eliminating that year's growth. So you were knocking that particular individual shrub back. It wasn't gonna produce, it wasn't gonna flower and produce fruit that year and then later come back when we could at the right time and cut it low and, and treat it. That's um, garlic mustard. You might be familiar with that one. Um, that's good for hand pulling if it's not vast expanses of it. It looks like a lot to me. And this is not, this is, I did find this image online. It looked like an awful lot of garlic mustard to ask volunteers to pull. But there are ways to, that this works really, really well. And you will, if you're gonna do invasive management on your own property, you're gonna need these tools, very basic. You might already have them, your loppers, your pruners, your handsaw, um, which they're also, you know, more less threatening looking handsaws that are folding, but that's my personal, that's our favorite. Um, and, and then this, and actually Emily was the first person who ever like mentioned the weed wrench to me many years ago, but this is this device that if you have just a small number of invasive shrubs and on your property, this is definitely something you can do to pull them out of the ground and get their root system out of the ground and be done with them without ever needing to use any kind of chemical. And it just works like a lever. You know, you're leveraging your weight to get that root system out. So these, these kind of had their moment. I feel like they were sort of like the hot item at some point and then... They're great for privet. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and it's like it's also a one like it would be really hard to do a really multi stem thing at the bottom, but um, definitely something to be aware of. But why would you not want to do manual removal, or why would it be almost prohibited at, at, at some occasions? And I kind of already touched on it with the ficaria burner. There's this issue of regeneration with those invasive shrubs. If we don't treat them, you cut them. And sometimes, you know, but frankly, if you do treat them and it just doesn't have the full effect, they put out new growth. They take that as a, as a challenge, <laughs> right? They're like, yeah, I'm going to come right back. And they just put out all this new growth and they just keep going and going. So that's a problem. There's the dispersal as with the fig buttercup, but you can really be doing harm. There are certain species like tree of heaven that are clonal. So they're not... You might see a thicket of tree of heaven, and it's not all individual trees. It's like one tree that's copied itself through root suckering. So they root sucker and they stump sucker. And again, just cutting it. And I, there's an individual who lives down the street from me who is producing this really amazing Alanthus nursery because <laughs> his work crew cuts it every year and it just gets bigger and bigger as a result. So yeah, not gonna work to try to pull that up. And you disturb soil. And so with manual removal, you have to weigh that in the balance and know that you're disturbing soil and, and soil disturbance itself is a vector for it in new invasives. You're, you're churning up seeds for one thing. So you don't wanna do it sometimes. But for small populations, like of your invasive vines, for instance, and in specific species, it's absolutely, I mean, we've done it, we, we keep doing it, and it certainly has worked on buttermilk trail. There's um, the area that, remember the red, that red area, but the area that's been managed has gone from being over 75% in base of cover to being 5% or below. Oh, wow. Wow. And I, yeah, and the same is true of some other spots as well. So and another reason to beware of manual removal, or at least to, to handle with care is because there they are, our little friends. And I, I often feel like I, there have been a couple times when I have been really like discouraged. And what am I doing? And is this worth it? And then it's always like at that moment that I see something. And at one one day in, in Pony Pasture, it was, there was a, he wasn't in the soil like this, but it was a box turtle. And they're out there and they're, you know, they're, they're struggling. You might probably, you probably already know this. They put restrictions. They're really stopping people from, legally stopping people from taking box turtles out of the wild. Um, they get decimated by cars, lawnmowers, people who don't allow leaves to accumulate on their property. They're losing habitat. But all, anyway, to the point, all these guys hibernate uh, or at least go you know, semi-dormant in that upper layer, layer of soil and leaf litter. So be gentle when you're manually removing stuff. So here are the prime, prime targets. Um, this is sort of the, the head of the class for invasive vines. Anybody have any of these? <laughs> what do you have? I think I have the English eye. Yeah. It's like the, between it's a fan house and there's a little stoop yeah. next between the steps. Yeah, and very there, popular for that. Kind of where thing. when I bought it, it holds the soil in, I guess. Right. I know that um, hornets have made um, nests in it. Mm. Um, but traps it should come out. Yes. Well, and here's the thing. I don't know, like, I, I don't, I'm not an absolutist, and I actually somebody just asked me the other day if I would absolve him of having English ivy, <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> in this case, no. But um, if you keep it contained, you know, if you keep it from spreading, and you don't let it grow up trees, that's like at the very least do that. But you know, you have it depends on the area too. Like those kinds this is of tiny. Very contained very contained, but it just depends on what the goals are. If somebody really wants to create native habitat and that's the space they have, then you would take it out, right? So all of these, yes, all of these are invasive. Periwinkle does not climb trees. It's about the only thing we can say about it. Winter creeper and English ivy have these adventitious aerial roots that attach to the tree. And then, you know, ultimately we should have brought, that's what we needed. Oh, we needed our garden because we have all of these, you know, cross sections of vine that are like this big. 
um, that started out like that, presumably. Japanese honeysuckle wraps, right? So if you want to get the, the stuff out, yes, um, you can hand pull small areas. You do have to be careful with debris. So debris management is like its own little category of invasive management. And particularly with English ivy, um, but I, you know, you could apply this to all invasive vines. You need to make sure that they aren't going to re-root. So if you just leave a pile of it on the ground, it will re-root. <laughs> uh, all it needs is a, not much, <laughs> not much to live on. Um, so you either want to like have a tarp down where you pile it up and it dries out, or you're, you're bagging it and tying it and throwing it out. Um, missing anything about that? Good enough? And why do we not want it to climb trees? Because this is what happens. These are advanced infestations and it brings them down, quite literally. We want to free our trees. That's one of the things we do. The, you know, we coined that term for the, that's the preserving mature tree canopy. But when a tree is really burdened by invasive vines, the invasive vines are taking more than their fair share of water and nutrients. They do trap moisture against the bark, which prevents the bark from doing what it needs to do. When the vines are so incredibly stout and thick and the tree is in case, the tree can't do that lovely thing it does in the wind, right? And so, and then there's just this added weight. There's, and I think somebody found a study one time, or maybe they were just thinking, oh, if only we could do this, calculate the weight of the vines on a tree, it's huge. When they're really far gone and you can't, you look at a tree and it's the middle of the summer and you don't know what kind of tree it is because you can't see the leaves, the tree can't photosynthesize and the tree can't be a tree. You can't do all the good things that trees do. And they, and then they are far more likely to come down in wind, snow, ice, etc. I'm sure you see like the sail, like the curtain of invasive vines hanging off of branches. So I probably don't, I think you probably all value trees and don't need to, you know, but if you have to persuade somebody for why they should free a tree, this is why. And it's a step-by-step -step process and you have to be really, really thorough to make sure you've done the job. Um, and I, you know, we do this all the time and there, uh, this is not like the best photo, but it, it, it's serviceable. So the first thing you do those little hand pruners, remember, is you go around the base of the tree, you know, maybe about six inches off the ground, maybe a little below, and you just, you're just you gonna cut all the small stuff. Everything that a pair of pruners can get through, that's what you're gonna do. And then you go, you're go you gonna go around again, and you're gonna get the next size of vine, and whoppers are great for the sort of in-between vines. And then when you get to something really big, you need a handsaw. And you wanna be extremely cautious and attentive to your tree to make sure you're not sawing into the bark of the tree. Uh, and you have to take out a cross section, as you can you know, probably see there, there's a big slice of it taken out. And then we treated the stump in the same way we treat the invasive shrubs because it will immediately put out new growth. And I have had the experience of freeing a tree, thinking it was being done for the first time and getting down and realizing, oh, we did this years ago before anyone could treat it. And it just came right back. <sighs> Uh, you got to get them all, and they're really sneaky. They really hide. Um, you have to be really patient and just know that, like, doing one tree well is better than, you know, saying that you did 10. And clearing around the base of the tree. If you've got an area, as we do in the park, where you're surrounded by the invasive vine, you want to give it a nice buffer. So you're giving it time. So that's vines and then shrubs. Um, he, we, I keep talking about um, your honeysuckle. We were talking about privet. Uh, burning bush and andina are two really popular ornamental shrubs that are non-native. Um, and particularly burning bush is just popping up in the park for me anyway. I keep finding it. So, and privet. The dominant invasive privet in the park is Chinese privet, but they are all non-native. So if you have privet, it is not native because we have no native, the, the genus is Ligostrum. They are not in North America. Little itty bitty ones, like little tiny privets, you can definitely pull them out of the ground, no problem. And that happens because birds are dispersing the seed. 
but it doesn't take long for them to get too big um, to do that. So that's where you know our cut and treat method comes in. And you definitely don't want to be handling these things and knocking them around and pulling them out when they're full of fruit, because then you're dispersing the fruit. Anybody have any questions about invasive shrubs? Have something that you want to get rid of? Andina. Mm. Mm. And I feel like it, the little ones just keep going. And I know there's like a lot of cultivars. I think that there's a, some variations. I feel like there are cultivars of Nandina. But um, if they're in your yard, I mean, you can probably pull, dig those out pretty well and monitor it, watch it for that regrowth. If you need to persuade anybody, you just bring up cedar wax wings. You're familiar with that? Yeah, that they've been correlated or associated with killing cedar wax wings who have this habit of overeating and binging and gorging themselves on Nandina berries, which happen to have trace amounts of cyanide, right? Cyanide. Oh, like, yeah. That's great. And yeah, it's so but it's everywhere, it's right? Everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. still spending it. Yeah. So Every yeah. other house in the fan has a Nandina. Yeah. It's just, you want to go knock on the door and say, would you like me to help you for that? <laughs> <laughs> Mind your own business. <laughs> Right. And some people, I mean, some people do take the the berries off and bag them, but I think that's what people like about it, right? Exactly. I mean, yeah. It's like, oh, I don't have poly, but I have this. Yeah. Yeah. So when you've got that great native plant book, it'll show you all the great stuff that you can plant instead. But let's say you've gotten rid of all your invasive plants. You, there is not an invasive plant to be seen. <laughs> Pretty clean. <laughs> Is it healthy? Is it habitat? No, this is not what we want you to do. This is also weirdly popular. I <laughs> yeah, like everybody's got their own, you know, yeah, trees and mulch, trees and mulch. This is the season of mulch, piles of mulch everywhere. No, don't do this. We want this. All of our gorgeous, rich ecosystem of native plants, the button bush and green and gold and um, strawberry bush and ironweed and I mean all these th these are just odds and ends that I have come across just blooming naturally in the park system or cutting you know coming up grasses um, and a few things that were planted on purpose but this is like I, I called it my cleansing your palate slide after all mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what it, this is why we do it that um the one on the left in the middle mm -hmm. what is that called um this is, might be an easier so the one in the left on the middle this one yeah hearts of Boston, strawberry bush euonymus americana well the far far left yep oh, mm -hmm. it's like deer tongue grass okay deer tongue yeah so and that just comes up in my yard in little roundish clumps mm -hmm. it's a clumping grass yeah yep so this is you know, this is what we can have instead, pretty, you know, pretty easily. But if you want to make that transition, because it's not just about, I mean, I will say that when it comes to habitat restoration, uh, or when it comes to the managing our sites, we have really tried to hew to this rule of wait and watch. You don't go like that and start planting. There might be certain circumstances where you do have to do that. If you have like, if you have this like really steep slope and it's nothing but ivy and you want to get it out, you can't strip that bare and just leave it. You know, you're probably going to employ erosion matting and native plugs or you know, you're going to need some, that takes, that takes the professionals for sure. But when a lot of what we do, we, we really follow the rule of wait and watch because there are seeds in the seeds and what we call the seed bank in the ground that, as I mentioned, are just waiting to sort of burst forth. So it's best to kind of be cautious and not leap into to plant because there are some risks associated with that. But in your yard, that might not, if you're, let's say you're getting rid of lawn, right? Then clearly you're gonna need to be part of that process. So you want to plan your species selection really carefully. And a nice place to start is with this book um, there are other resources we can direct you to as well. You want to make sure you're selecting plants that are truly native to Richmond, not native to the Mid-Atlantic, 
not native to North America, not even native to Virginia, somewhere in Virginia, it's here. Um, and you want to think, consider the source you're talking. So labeling, when you look at a plant label, and if you're if you're working with a, a native plant nursery, it's going to be a very different experience than if you're going to work sort of a commercial nursery. But um, you need to look at the label not just for the species and making sure it's not a cultivar, which is a whole other kind of complicated topic. But also, where is it from? Where was it propagated? So is it we we really uh, emphasize local ecotype, and that's the the opportunity to get plants that were locally grown from local seed is getting better and better with a lot of our producers. Are local nurseries that only provide native plants, like are there, can you name a handful? Of, I mean, are there? Yeah, I mean, and they're growing and growing. So Reedy Creek Environmental is a real leader in that. Um, Molten Hot Natives is another, but there's, there's plant, there's a, there's a bunch. And so I don't want to like favor anybody because they, they really are increasing, but uh, when you go to the Virginia Native Plant Society, if you go into the native plants, there's a, there's a list of nurseries. Um, and you just want to try to stick as close to home as possible. And if you're straying from home, and this is something I just, that Bill Shannon brought with Reedy Creek Environmental, just kind of the scales fell from my eyes when he said this. But he said, if you can't find something you want, you know, in Richmond in terms of this local ecotype, the genetics of that plant, would you go to a nursery west of here or south of here? <laughs> Trick question. Anybody have any ideas? Like I think, Matt, I think he had, I think he had miles. Maybe it was miles. Like, well, you want to go a little bit south because you're still in the Piedmont. You're still in like this sort of Piedmont verging on coastal plain range. You don't want to go way out to the to the Allegheny Mountains, for instance. That's a radical, you know, radical change. So you're just kind of hewing to this um, southeastern Virginia um, area. But yeah, you can find the nurseries there. Uh, let's see, and let's, here's some more resources. You've got your oh. invasive field guide. So on the invasive side of things, you've got your field guide, which is really great for getting to know your plants. Blue Ridge Prism, amazing resources for private landowners. And even though they are focused in the Blue Ridge, oh, there's a lot of overlap. I mean, they're dealing with the same species or they're quite similar. Uh, forestry, DOF's got some great resources as well. If you go to Natural Heritage, DCR, there's also the Native Plant Finder, which is a portal where it will kind of spit out a list for you of some plants that might be right for your site. Because you also have to look at, I mean, I am guilty of this. For ye I have a com just completely shaded yard. It's all tree canopy. And yet, I think I'm going to grow something that needs sun to part sun, you know, and then they have these poor, poor, pitiful looking solidagos and, you know, ironweed that never blooms and stuff like that, because it's like, it's, you just gotta accept it. But they have this nice little portal where you can enter, you know, in terms of your sun and shade and moisture and all these different little factors, and it will give you suggestions. Um, so that's really helpful. I'm just saying if there was anything else. Uh, the Virginia Plant Atlas, this is for the, if you're, you know, want to geek out, but the Flora of Virginia project, which is the flora of Virginia, right? Like everything, every species. I wish, I wonder what the number is. Do you have any idea? Like how many native species, plant species there are in Virginia? Oh, thousands. Thousands. We have 300 native, we have 300 plant, natural plant communities in Virginia. Such a incredibly diverse, rich place. Um, but you can go to the digital atlas here at virginiaplantatlas.org and go to county. And Richmond City is not listed, but you can go to Henrico County or Chesterfield County, which are proxies for the city of Richmond. And it will give you a list, a taxonomic list of every native species that's been documented and verified. Uh, not, and all, any, excuse me, any species, period. Yeah, that's been documented and verified and it'll let you know if it's native, non-native. There's some other, and then, and then there's a few that are like, we really don't know. Um, so that's extremely helpful if you're like, I wanna make sure that this is 
a species that belongs here. So, and uh, I would just add that if you're interested, we always have, well, maybe not always, most weeks out of the year, you have the opportunity to volunteer with us in the James River Park system. Generally, five events a week, most months out of the year, unless we're really busy doing something else, or it's, uh, ex we have conditions that are um, inhospitable, <laughs> meaning really extreme heat and humidity and yellow jacket activity. So we, we do take uh, volunteer well-being. Obviously, as a priority, we do have to cancel events sometimes because of weather or different conditions. But you can go to the Friends website, jamesriverpark.org, go to the calendar. And this is the easiest way to see like all the invasive events at once because they're just really cleanly display there. You can also go directly to Community Foundation Engage. It's just, it's a little harder to sort that. But if you go to the Friends calendar, each of those events should have a link to the registration, which we do use CF Engage for that. And it's really important to register, even if it seems a little bit like an extra step, so that we can communicate with you. So that, you know, we can, if there are any special directions, something changes or something gets canceled, we, you know, and we also just need to know what to expect. Am I getting five people or am I getting 10 people? Um, so we do really appreciate that. But it's, it's, a, it's a great way to, you know, give back to the park. It's a great way to learn by experience. Um, and that's what we, you know, we rely on volunteers, as I said. So that's it and we have plenty of time for questions. Yay, thank you.